And I was like, Martin, I mean, this is the third place team in the Bundesliga. I mean, this is a very, very good result for Spurs. Any win is a good win. He's like, what are you talking about, mate? This is a Wolfsburger <laughs> in Austria. This is not Wolfsburg. OTB AM. Live weekday mornings from 7.30 on the OTB Sports app. You ain't shit. I wish I was 50 years younger you and I'd care. kick your ass. <laughs> Well, fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not like Stephen Rochard has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. This is the Saturday panel. This week we're chatting to the former Olympian Olive Loch Nan, Kerry footballer Louise Galvin and the chartered physiotherapist and tutor Helen Keepel about pregnancy and sport with advice for elite level athletes, do's and don'ts, post-pregnancy and fitness tips for the nine months for expectant mothers, whatever your level of fitness. Uh, this week, the former Wimbledon Australian and the US Open tennis champion Anjali Kerber announced she's pregnant. She'll take a break from the sport for the next few months. The 34-year-old German revealing the news on the eve of this year's US Open, a tournament she won in 2016. She's going to take a step back from the game now, meaning she's going to miss out on Flushing Meadows. So the aim of the panel today to provide some insight into what pregnancy means for an elite athlete, to give advice on fitness and exercise for expectant mothers out there who are listening and are watching in. So obviously I'm a male. <laughs> uh, so this is a topic a lot of men, including myself, might not know a lot about. It's not discussed very often. So we figured it might be a good opportunity this week to get into it. A lot of us have had, are having, will have children. One of the biggest things in life possibly the biggest, probably the biggest thing. So we're joined by Helen Keeble in studio. Helen, you're a chartered physio and tutor. You're a specialist in lumbopelvic health and a female return to sports. You're co-founder of UMI Health and you're CrossFit Level 1 trainer. I hope you're well because it looks like you're nearly about to give birth. Not, not right now, but you're, what, nine months pregnant? I'm nine months pregnant, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully nothing happens on air. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it shouldn't. Um, just, just to maybe explain... Uh, about the work you do. Tell us your story when it comes to the area of pregnancy and sport and fitness and, and the work you get involved in. Yeah, so I'm a pelvic health physio and I specialise in sports. Um, so for the last kind of 14 odd years, I've basically been working with women um, and like during their pregnancy, I would just be helping support them to be able to perform as well as they can. So mainly they come to me for their core, so their abdominal stuff or pelvic floor work. Um, so if they have like any leaking or concerns about like any symptoms they're having, then I'll help them out and basically get them better. Um, or in the last, I'd say, maybe five years, we've had a really big influx of people coming in who are being really proactive and who maybe don't have symptoms but want to keep it that way. Um, and obviously our, our pelvic floor muscles only, well, tend to get mentioned a lot during pregnancy. Some people have no idea where they are, what they do, so they want to clue up about that. But then also it really helps to support their core to then be able to perform better in their sport. Um, so it's it's win-win really, either symptom relief or prevention. So you're a CrossFit trainer. So how has and how will your pregnancy affect your fitness pattern? Because this is not your first child. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, well, in theory, pregnancy doesn't, obviously you're going to end up with doing um, kind of like alterations to your um, yeah. sport, but actually like as long as everything is going really well, then you can actually carry on doing your chosen sport or you can start exercise during pregnancy. Um, so there's a lot of myths out there still around sport and exercise in pregnancy, but actually it's so beneficial, so helpful for the mum, for the baby. Um, so like the advice now is like definitely carry on doing what you're doing. Um, you know, obviously as a pregnancy progresses and you get a bigger bump, then you're going to have to maybe adapt a few things and less abdominal specific work and things like that. But in general, you can carry on like I have carried on doing CrossFit for my two pregnancies. Um, you know, you kind of scale back a little bit on maybe the weight you're lifting and things like that. But otherwise you can, you know, there is a level for everyone. So you just have to kind of keep going. Louise and Olive, how's the form? Not too bad. Um, Louise, so we saw you on social media there interviewed by uh, Ashley O'Reilly after Kerry game the summer at Croke Park and you were holding the baby. Uh, what's the baby's name? And you might give us some background, uh, Louise, about your experience of having a child and playing uh, sports at the top level. Uh, yeah, my um, a son at the end of March, Florian, Florian Walsh. Um, so I suppose I, I went back playing county football last year and um, even I suppose going back to even the pregnancy side of things, 
um, I didn't realise actually it was the middle of the championship season when um, I probably figured out that I was expecting Florian. So even at that stage, like, um, you know, as Hedham was saying, um, I got advice from my GP and continued played up until 12 weeks um, because that was the advice then in, in a low risk pregnancy as it was at the time that um, you can play contact sport up until that stage. And then I tried to remain as active as possible whilst not playing contact sport for the rest of my pregnancy. Um, and again, I guess what happened this season then was I didn't make any promises about trying to get back because um, I suppose there's so much out of your control when you're pregnant having a baby. You can't really set any timeline on anything. Um, but I obviously thoroughly enjoy playing uh, football for Kerry and the girls are going very well. And um, I suppose my recovery was going better than I'd expected kind of coming to six, seven, eight weeks. Um, now, I, I suppose as we go on into the conversation, I, I probably speak about how little information is out there and how um, difficult it is to kind of figure out what you should be doing. But I suppose I'm a bit strong willed and I don't know, big headed at times as well. And I managed to find out enough information and get an assessment from a public health physio, just like Helen and Clarny that helped guide me. Um, and I went back playing into county about maybe or training into county, I should say, about 10 weeks after Florian was born. Um, now that was a whole kind of, a, I suppose, conversation between management and, and players and um, my own family. Obviously, it had to be the right thing for the baby, as was the other side of things as I was breastfeeding him as well. So I think that was kind of what made things a bit unusual for that um, interview in Coke Park, because it was this was unusual. But, the details around it, you know, you're trying to get the baby into the dressing room as soon as that possible afterwards to feed him. Um, so that was kind of my story. I, you know, I, I didn't actually probably get back to my full um, capacity as a footballer, but I thoroughly enjoyed being part of the panel and we made it all the way to the All-Ireland final, which was a brilliant experience. And it was, you know, it was class to have him on game day and out in Co Park on All-Ireland final day as well. Olive, what was your experience like when you... Uh... You know, became pregnant. You were one of Ireland's top walkers. You're an Olympian, and you went back to the sport after having your child. Yeah, I'm afraid we seem to have an issue there with um with Olive's line. So we'll come back to Olive in a moment. But Louise, so you get the news you're pregnant. Uh, what changes in terms of the fitness plan? Do you do less? Do you change the type of exercise you do? Is there a moment in the nine month journey when you stop? As you said, was it twelve weeks? Yeah, I suppose at a contact sport, um, things are a little different because obviously as the, well, Helen would probably, you know, the exact terminology for this, but uh, my GP advised that, um, you know, contact sport, you, there is a certain stage where maybe there's a little bit more risk. Um, I suppose as like a background is I'm a physiotherapist as well, but not in this area. So I, I suppose all that showed me was that I'd, I needed to find out a lot more information. Um, so I did continue. I think I played two games, three games maybe, very early on where I didn't realize and then my the last game where I knew I was kind of coming to my maybe ninth week or so um and it was more dealing with nausea and you know the usual symptoms of being in that first kind of trimester um and then after that it's just trying to nearly keep it quiet because you're starting into club championship as well um and you're trying to continue as normal but knowing you're you're going to be kind of pulling out of um, contact and competitive games soon enough but I'd be someone who'd be quite used to being fit and active always so um I tried to maintain like a bit of a gym at the back. Um, I stayed running for maybe up to 16, 17 weeks. Um, but then I, I suppose I've played a, a lot of sport all my life. I kind of took it as a chance to take a little bit of a break from the high level stuff. Um, like uh, Helen's obviously completely right in that you want to train as much as possible because you have to be fit for the labor. You have to be fit to lift and carry a baby straight afterwards as well. Um, but I think from my point of view, I kind of took it as a step back because you can be fit to, you can be doing exercise and being fit, but you're still not at your optimum. So you're not going to be able to perform maybe as well as um, you could when you're not pregnant. Um, so maybe I took it as a little bit of a break as well and then came back gung-ho once um, once I had the baby at the end of March. Just let uh, some of the listeners know that Man United leads Southampton 1-0, Bruno Fernandes with the goal. So we have Olive there. Olive, um, so you had a child and you went back walking. So maybe go through the whole experience of pregnancy and sport from your perspective. Yeah, I can re I can relate to a lot of the things that Helen Helen and Louise spoke about. So um, 
look, I, I knew I was pregnant from a very early stage um, and it was very much about kind of finding the right balance between keeping fit, um, but also, you know, protecting the baby and, and doing what was best for the baby. I mean, I personally found I couldn't like run after run or race walk from kind of 12 weeks on, 13 weeks on. That was impacting on my lumbar spine. Um, but I stayed really fit um, and I guess I, you know, the challenges as, as a sports person and then as someone who's competitive, you, you kind of like to do something. So I learned to swim while I was pregnant. Um, so, yeah, I was a bit of a latecomer to that. And that just that was wonderful because, you know, in the water, you're so, you're so weightless. Um, the other piece I did a lot of was um, I used a cross trainer and, and that kept my cardiovascular fitness up. And I guess as an athlete, you kind of almost need exercise um, and it, it just made me feel feel good. Um, so then after I had Emer, Emer was born in Dublin. Um, and I had a section with Emer. Um, so look, about 10 days after um, when when we all got back from Dublin and down to Cork, I started back uh, doing bits um, and I was running um, pretty quickly, doing a lot of doing a lot of swimming. I just it was just nice to have a little break um, and to give Emer time with with Martin, my husband. Um, and, and that was important, too. As regards beating, um, I fed him until I was about until she was about three months. Um, but look, to be quite honest with you, um, and I'm wary of, of saying, you know, I know Louise, you're you're just getting back, or you you know, you've recently had a baby. I would say, in terms of my ability to perform at a very elite level, it was um, it was eighteen months to to two years um, and probably some of that was because I rushed back I did you know I, I did an Olympic standard qualification standard after Emer, about five months after Emer was born probably rushed things too much um, and as a result of that then like it, it probably took me longer to get back realistically um, but no it was all all good I was happy and you know Emer's 16 now, so it's it's a long time ago. Um, but I do remember reaching out to, to Sonia, who obviously had her two children while she was still competing. Um, and, and she was really helpful to me and, and gave me some great advice. And she was living in Australia. Um, so I guess they had probably done a little bit more research into it at the time. So, you know, she and their, I suppose their attitude was very much about getting back, you know, moving as quickly as possible. So so that kind of information was really, really helpful to me. So as an elite athlete, uh, Olive, uh, is there kind of a, a bit of a friction between the fact that you got to instinctively be careful and then obviously you want to push your body as much as you can? Yeah, look, I have to be honest and say, yeah. You know, and it was very much heart rate based for me, um, never exerting myself. Um, literally, I was on a cross trainer for like I was still using the the cross trainer about an hour a day um, and then walking as well as in regular walking. Um, but yeah, that friction is there. So it was about like being kind to yourself, being good to yourself um, and, and thinking of, of the best for everybody. And I was lucky to have, you know, a great um, obstetrician who was really supportive, um, Susanna Sullivan and Cork, and she was really supportive of, of you know, um, helping me to, to work through the bits and pieces. How did you manage the stress levels then, Louise, when you're, when you're still playing at the very start and, and you know that your child is on the way? Um, <laughs> stress levels, I'm not sure. I suppose, like, once I knew I wasn't putting the baby under any risk or I don't think it had any either any more stress yeah. to game day, if that makes sense. I mean, I had my body trained to perform and to play at inter county level, and I mean there was no physical bump or anything. So again, besides a little bit of nausea and a bit of extra fatigue, which are manageable for a game, then there wasn't any major difficulties at that stage. I suppose it's more um, trying to avoid the end of season. Um, knees up that <laughs> yeah. without sharing any information is nearly more stressful um, <laughs> but good. I think it, I certainly I didn't find the that part stressful or difficult uh, it was the post it, that's where the real lack of information the lack of knowledge is okay. that I found anyway and that um, the lack of guidelines and I mean I remember the public health nurse coming out to me and I said when can I return to contact sport and she looked at me as if I had 10 heads and said she'd never been asked that before and she was a bit like your first time mom, you're not worried about your baby and keeping it alive. 
um, which obviously I was concerned about as well. But I guess you're always straight away you're thinking. I, I with the split season with GA this year, it was always hanging around in the background. Like I never made any public desire that I wanted to come back, but it was hanging there. And like Olive, I'd had um, emergency section in the end, so that added a little bit more of a delay to the recovery side of things. Um, so yeah, I think the more frustrating part for me is the actual return to sport and return to play. And I'd agree with level with Olive as well. I'm certainly not back at where I was before, and there's a certain element of me wondering what is um, achievable in terms of my peak fitness and strength and just playing ability. Um, but I guess we won't know unless you try. Yeah, we're chatting here on the Saturday panel with Louise Galvin, uh, the Kerry footballer, the Olympian Olive Lochnan and the physiotherapist and tutor Helen Keeble about pregnancy and sport. And and Helen, we'll get on to just uh, regular, in inverted commas, expectant mothers um, that are not elite level athletes in a moment. But just for the elite level athletes, you know, what would your sense of the navigation path for the nine months be? Yeah, it's... Well, I'm, I was like nodding along listening to Louise and Olive that like there's just not really... There isn't a designated pathway or a designed pathway as okay. of yet, but like it would apply to be fair whether you're recreational or elite. But it's more so that so we want to keep them really fit and active as much as possible. Um, it's interesting Olive me- mentioned about heart rate because the research used to tell us that we shouldn't basically exert ourselves more than 140 beats per minute. But the research has moved on now to say that we can actually it's completely safe to exert yourself up to 80 percent of your heart rate. So like. Research is moving along, things are catching up, but I think in terms of getting information out there and helping especially elite athletes to know what to do and how to navigate these few months is still really lacking. Um, But basically, we just need to keep them moving, keep them active and keep them as like doing as much of their sport as is sport specific as possible. So for, uh, you know, just... uh as we would say, a recreational athlete, mm. an expectant mother. There's a range of disciplines here. You've got running, walking, cycling, swimming, um, everything. Should it be treated on a case-by-case basis or should we? is there just a common advice for what are the good tips for an expectant mother that wants to keep up their fitness during pregnancy? Yeah, so the, the general advice really is to keep doing what you're doing. And if you want to start something new in pregnancy, then that is actually okay. But we would tend to just say start gradually. And if you have any symptoms in terms of like, you know, the obvious things in terms of like leaking or prolapse symptoms, things like that, as well as other pregnancy related problems, then obviously would say stop and see a physio or see your doctor, see your midwife. Um, But generally it's keep doing what you're doing. The only ones that we'd say, okay, you kind of have to stop are the contact sports once you're in that second trimester because then the baby isn't protecting the pelvis anymore and it starts to come up and out. So that's why we say stop contact sports. Um, And the same goes for any scuba divers out there or anyone um, performing at high altitude. So they're the ones that we kind of say you can't because of physiological risk to the baby. Um, But otherwise, you can keep running, you can keep swimming, you can keep doing yoga, walking, cycling, whatever you prefer, really, because we used to kind of tell everybody to take it easy. So to keep moving, but maybe choose things like yoga or Pilates that are typically a bit less effortful. But now, thankfully, we can do whatever we like within reason. (laughs) What was your sense of the do's and don'ts, Olive, during your nine months when you were, um, you know, trying to keep fit during pregnancy? I'm, I'm glad I didn't know that you could keep going to 80% of heart rate <laughs> because I would have probably taken that literally. Um, the do's and don'ts, it is a question of listening to your body. It is, you know, remembering that you have a little person growing inside you and, and, and doing the best for them. But, you know, like what's good for mom is, is good for the baby too. And as I say, certainly I, I needed that exercise for my own mental well-being as well, you know, um, so, yeah, it was just very much listen to your body. I had a great physiotherapist um, at the time, you know, who supported me. Um, and I know certainly like the elite athletes now that are, are carded under the high performance carding scheme, they work with um, the service provider the Institute, the Sport Ireland Institute, to put together and, you know, to put in place a plan that that works for them, that works for their, their you know, with the support of their coaches, but works for them and their family and, and, and just makes sure that everybody is OK. 
Um, so I kind of wish I had that, <laughs> that support when I was pregnant. Um, but for me, it was just kind of listening to my listening to my body, um, but recognizing the massive benefit that that exercise could could still deliver for me. Um, and yeah, keep me healthy for for everything that came afterwards. Yeah, Louise, it's not just about giving up the vice of, say, cigarettes and alcohol. It's also about maintaining um, a level of fitness or, or even just maybe doing a bit of strength work. Um, is that something that you were able to continue throughout the nine months for yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's important. I know we're talking about elite athletes. We're also talking about yeah. just recreational exercise. That if you don't exercise, like Helen said, from someone who's gone through it recently, I would say start exercising because, you know, gradually follow the advice but you do need to be so fit and strong for the labor for afterwards. I mean, you get this advice when you're leaving hospital not to lift anything even in your baby and then all the equipment, the strollers, the, you know, the everything that goes with them, you, you can't avoid lifting. So it's kind of counterproductive advice, to be honest. Um, I think it's really important that even if a woman hasn't been fit and active and she finds out she's pregnant that, you know, as well as stopping the smoke and stopping the alcohol or looking at the foods that you're not able to eat to look at the activity levels and to follow that guidelines that are out there to you know maintain kind of a healthy weight um, and as I've mentioned as well for your mental health I mean exactly I'm an, as an athlete all my life I found it very hard not to be part of um, a team during my pregnancy but I was just out walking all the time similarly also took up swimming although I didn't quite master it I have to say I'll have to go back to the lessons but you just start trying to pick up other things to fill your time because you're so used to to being part of a team um and that strengthening side of things is important as well because obviously the hormonal changes in your body that are happening and to allow you to I suppose expand and to allow you to um, be able to carry the baby to term and then deliver it um it doesn't mean you kind of just let everything go weak and floppy you can still maintain strength in other parts of your body to help support support your skeletal system and um, just make the again the pregnancy the labor and the period afterwards easier we're speaking to Louise Galvin, uh, Olive Lochnan and Helen Keeble on the Saturday panel on having a child and playing elite sport, but also managing fitness levels for all expectant mothers. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. This is Off The Ball Saturday on News Talk with John Duggan until five this afternoon. You can text us 53106 or tweet us at Off The Ball. This is part two of the Saturday panel. We're chatting to the former Olympian Olive Lochnan, the Kerry footballer Louise Galvin and the chartered physiotherapist and tutor Helen Keeble about pregnancy and sport with advice for elite level athletes, do's and don'ts, post-pregnancy and fitness tips for expectant mothers. Uh, for the nine months. We got some texts in here on 53106. Uh, I just had my second baby in March. I did my usual gym classes up to 39 weeks with both my pregnancies, but was back skiing seven weeks postpartum and did a buggy boot camp class during both maternity leaves. I believe it helped me giving birth, being fit and certainly helped my recovery. But I did deal with a lot of people, especially men, telling me I, what I could and what I couldn't do. And I'm not uh, talking about doctors, just random people see me exercising and deciding to tell me what I can and can't do. Another text on 53106. Uh, very happy to hear you covering this topic, removing the stigmas. Preparing for birth is so important. Question for Helen Keeble, who's educating the doctors and consultants in, on the change in insights into what's okay for women to do and also to encourage women to exercise during pregnancy. Often my friends and I talk about the limited information doctors and consultants provide on this, usually only found through our own research or Instagram, says Julie. Yeah, it's such a good point. Um, and actually, as doctors, like all healthcare professionals, they're actually responsible for educating themselves to an extent. You know, we all have to keep up to date with the latest research and evidence out there. So they're kind of responsible for themselves to be up to date. Um, but yeah, I would really relate to what she's saying, unfortunately. Like the information just still isn't really getting out there. Olive, you were saying that 16 years ago you had your child. Has the information space completely changed now? Because it seems that from what I've heard for the last half hour, the more you seek out the information, the better you'll be able to tailor your journey over the nine months. Yeah, I, I do really think it has. Um, I would experience, you know, a lot of, of what the listeners spoke about there. Um, so, yeah, I do think things have, have moved on, as I said. You know, certainly I know within... Um, the carding scheme that athletes on that carding scheme are are given the opportunity to consult with medical professionals and it's recognised, you know, you're not under pressure to get back. Um, there's very specific guidelines there that you will continue to get funding, which I think, to be fair, if they'd been around uh, when I was competing, would have been really helpful. 
um, because you would have, you know, focused on what the best thing to do in the longer term was. So I think people's awareness of it as well, um, you know, ha- has improved. So certainly like there is a specific maternity policy there for elite athletes. Um, and I know it was something that I would have felt very passionate about um, as as would Lynn Cantwell. Um, but we were very much, you know, working with Sport Ireland and pushing an open door there because it's it's recognised now that this is something that women need to be supported around. Um, and I think part of that is based on the fact that, like, I know myself and Louise, I, I heard you talk about, you know, what, what could be possible. But my best days as an athlete were after I had my daughter, Emer. You know, I, I returned to competition bigger, stronger. <laughs> Not sure bigger is better for, for a race walker, but stronger and, and, and mentally more relaxed. So I think that that all helps. And also, obviously, our ability to access information is much greater. I, I emailed Sonia, you know, and, and she was really helpful to me. Whereas now, you know, you'd be looking at stuff online and, and yeah, it's a, it's a whole different ball game. But we still have a way to go. You know, it is important to normalise this. It is important to have those conversations. Um, and also, I mean, one of the, the things that struck me there was, you know, you do what's right for you and, and, and your baby. And look, I was lucky to be able to go back training quickly and, and, and to perform pretty quickly again. And and Louise, Louise, you were too. But like that might not be the best solution for, for other people. Um, So it is about looking at the whole picture and, and, and just seeing this as, as something that you need to um take your time with, really. Yeah, Louise, this shouldn't be viewed as a barrier to achievement. It's like Alison Felix is one of the greatest ever athletes ever. And Nike tried to reduce her pay when she became a mother. Now, they did a U-turn and they eventually had a performance-related reduction uh, frozen for 18 months. But this is welcome because I think from an attitude point of view, having a child should not be seen as an impediment to achievement or going back as Olive did and being even better. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where we really need to change the narrative. And I just really second what Olive was saying as well, that I don't want this panel to come across to people that you should be going back to high level sports. Every case is individual and every family situation is completely individual. But I guess what we're trying to say is if you want to go back, the guidelines should be there, the information should be available and it should be achievable. I guess that's yeah. kind of what we're coming across with here today. Um, but yeah, it's, it's incredible that in this day and age that could st- that, you know, multinational massive company like Nike could still suggest that that is okay to do it. Um, I suppose Olive was mentioning there how um, like the works of Lynn Cantwell um, and Sport Ireland that the college athletes now have a lot more accessibility to um, information if they are to become pregnant. Before I played um, into county football, which is obviously amateur, we don't have any contracts or anything like that. Um, I was with the IRFU and I remember one of the things I was working with with the Rugby Players Ireland was trying to bring in a similar, I suppose, a scheme with um, the sevens contracts that we had at the time because again there was nothing if a player had become pregnant and it hadn't happened but it was trying to look towards the future and I know there will be new rugby con- contracts coming out and I'm sure this will be something that will be looked at for both sevens and fifteens as well because again it shouldn't be a barrier to you playing your sport or it shouldn't be something that you feel you need to put off having children because you want to continue to playing sport it should be completely allowed supported considered natural if you want to do it and likewise that there isn't that pressure on the other side that you need to come back to perform as quickly as possible and that you're given that time and space to um, see what you want to do what you're able to do um, and to, that support to be able to come back to full fitness and performing if you want to do that Was there a support structure in the GA for that? I, I don't want to say there isn't because yeah, I didn't yeah. look for yeah, it yeah. Um, but again this is something that maybe like we've had GA, LGFA, Camogie Association, whereas then the GPA encompasses all three. So it might be something that could be looked at. Um, and I guess that that's what it was important for me. It wasn't the reason I came back, but I think with all the, um, I suppose, exposure after that interview, I did in Co Park and made me realise that not a lot of people maybe do come back to inter-county sport after having a baby. And the, as maybe the breastfeeding was seen as a bit of a barrier for some players as well that maybe we can look at and setting up a bit of a think tank and trying to share that information just like Olive did chasing up Sonia that even to have a group of women that have done it um, that you know other players can reach out to so that 
it's not seen as the death knell for your sporting career. Because again, much like Oliver said, that she came back a better athlete eventually. But in, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but it, my thoughts would be, I suppose, that uh, in an endurance sport, you mightn't peak until further into your 30s or 40s or whatever anyway, whereas maybe in explosive contact sports, it tends to be more in your 20s. So there, uh, certainly I will openly say I put off having kids to continue playing sport, and as soon as I fell pregnant, I wasn't sure if I'd ever play into county sport again. Was that the case, then, Olive? Because it was an endurance sport that you you felt that you did become a better athlete post pregnancy and post childbirth. Um, yeah, possibly. Um, yeah, I, I sir, yeah, I, I got stronger as a, as a result of it. In one sense, I was I was physically stronger. I think, to be quite honest, though, for me. Some of it was that I was, you know, you, it kind of puts things into perspective for you. Um, so it does. And, you know, as, as an athlete in an individual sport, you tend to be very uh, focused in on on one particular thing. And I guess in one sense, I, I was just a bit more relaxed. Um, and and Emer had some challenges after after she was born as well. So I think, as I say, you, you just see the bigger picture. Touching on, on what Louise said there, like it does you know, women, it is a consideration for women because it doesn't just stop, you know, when, when the baby comes out. <laughs> As my husband reminded me when when I said I was going to be talking to you guys today, um, like it does, you need to have that support structure behind you. And I couldn't have done what I did post um, post maternity and, and post pregnancy if I didn't have, you know, a very supportive um, husband, um, my own family and my husband's family, because, you know, I still did have to go away on training camps. Um, so, yeah, it, it it should be it should be. Obviously, you're going to have to look, look at the big picture, but women shouldn't be, you know, in an ideal world, you, you don't have to put put off having children until until you've uh, finished um, your sporting career. Certainly, I mean, I know that I retired at 36 um, and look, I knew I wanted to have more children. And, and while while I suppose my career had come to a bit of a natural end in, in any case, um, it wouldn't have been possible for me to have any more and, and, and still compete just the, the circumstances I was in. It would have been too big of an ask, you know, for everybody involved. So, as I say, it doesn't just stop when you have the baby. It's like having those structures afterwards. And I, you know, I saw Louise there and I suppose maybe I'm just thinking in a team situation that might be a little bit easier because, you know, you'll have more people there and um, helping you out and stuff. But certainly I had to make a decision, you know, when Emer was about a year old, that the best thing for me and for her when I was going in training camps was was to ask my mom and and my mother in law um, and my husband to to cover that time when I was away um, because, you know, that that's that was what was best for us. So um, I think that's the piece, the practical side of it as well. It's not just about the the medical side of it, but the practical side of it. Um, is important to consider too. And you have to be regimented about your time, Olive, like managing sleep is, I'm sure, a challenge. Yeah, it was. It was. You know, I, I joke about like, as and, and I know this is going to make people who are not full-time, full-time athletes, excuse me, um, jealous, but like, I was lucky enough, you know, as a full time athlete to be able to rest between training sessions because I was training twice a day and, and, and doing heavy mileage and, and in the gym as well. But my daughter was very obliging and, <laughs> and slept during the day as well. So um, whereas I don't think any of my other children would have would have worked in that regime. So look, you, you just have to go with the flow. Um, so sleep wasn't actually um, my my daughter liked the bed just as much as I did. So I, I did well there. Are you getting enough sleep, Louise, with the with the sporting Do career? You know, and the... Yeah, but that was it. I suppose one thing that worked for me is having played um, sevens for so long. I had done that full time athlete space for a number of years. So I kind of was like, maternity leave is when I'm back playing I can treat treat it like being a full-time athlete again just have a, a newborn hanging off me too and he was he was quite obliging he's going through a bit of an old sleep regression or something like that at the moment now all right so we, we timed it kind of well but um no he he was pretty, pretty obliging and I guess when you are coming back for anyone who may be coming out the other side of pregnancy and wants to come back to you know even club games um there is so much out of your control and if you stress that then it just doesn't work. You have to go with what you can control. Again, I was lucky I have a bit of a gym out the back 
and the gym session might take two hours instead of one hour because you're constantly going over and entertaining them or changing position or even just stopping and feeding them or winding them. Um, but, you know, I kind of have the day to do it. I was on maternity leave, so um, it was no major, you know, I, I'm more looking at the perspective of at least I have the time to do it and I have the, the space to do it. Um, and as I say, he was pretty content with the whole thing because just like Olive said with um, her daughter, Emer, if it's not working with the baby, if it's not, you know, they're the priority no matter what um, after having them, then it's just not going to work. And again, the support system is huge. Like Olive mentioned there about me being in a team sport, I definitely felt that when I came back. Um, and we had two male joint managers, um, Declan and Dara, and, you know, they were both young dads. And I think that helped because they kind of understand, understood um, the demands of being kind of a mom to a newborn and definitely my husband and my family and his family, everyone who helped out as well, and the girls and the team, like I literally remember handing him over to shower after games, um, handing him over to sleep and then taking him back again. So there is that support network. As I say, it takes a village. Absolutely does, doesn't it, Louise? Louise Galvin and we have Olive Lachnan and Helen Keeble on pregnancy and sport. Any questions for our panel? 53106, do get in touch if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panel. And Helen, I suppose post-pregnancy, uh, what type of work are you doing with women who've recently given birth and are getting back on the fitness trail? Yeah, so again, it can be really anything, but the like the foundations really apply to every single person after having a baby. And by that, I mean their core. So really making sure their abdominals have come back together again. So it takes about six to eight weeks after having a baby for your abdominal muscles to come back together again. In a small number of women, they don't naturally come together. So then I work with them to make sure that they can recover and regain their full strength um, and function, of course. And then the pelvic floor so the pelvic floor is at the bottom of our core and so the pelvic floor would be so important after giving birth so even if you had a c-section our pelvic floor is still really crucial if you have a vaginal delivery then obviously they go through a little bit more but no matter the delivery method the pelvic floor muscles are still really 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 important um, and it's interesting what Olive and Louise were saying there about length of time to recover because um, it's been shown that like our abdominal muscles and our pelvic floor take like it was coming out recently now that anything up to about six to 12 months to actually recover and recoil back down and kind of get that tensile strength back. So if I haven't seen the, the mum before, then it's all about teaching them the basics and getting their pelvic floor working well and can they activate the pelvic floor okay and then actually kind of begin their rehab. So get it stronger again, improve the endurance, the strength, everything else around that. And then once the basics or the foundations are set, then we can start applying that into their, whatever they're trying to get back to in terms of being a bit more sports specific or exercise focused. Um, you know, we'd kind of always, I'd always advise people to start kind of general first, so a bit of walking and not going back into high impact too quickly. Um, so like generally the guidelines will say, wait about three months for high impact. And by that, I mean things like running or tennis or, you know, things where you're kind of like jumping and leaving the floor basically. Um, but there's loads you can do before that three month mark if you're if you want to and if you're kind of feeling well and able to um, you know everyone is so different and having a baby is just like it turns your world upside down so some people feel that they do have the spare energy to kind of commit back into exercise sometimes it's different so three months would be kind of like the earliest to get back to high impact um, but a lot of mums I see they may not they may not start that until like five six eight months down the line um, it's really all about how she's doing and how she's recovering and kind of what she wants to do, basically. And you're involved in an online education space around this as well at the moment. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I launched um, an online platform called Umi Health. Um, and basically, like the girls here were saying, that it's really to kind of help people get solid evidence-based non-biased information out there that's easily accessible um, so it was about a year in the making before we actually launched it and then we launched it just as we went into our first lockdown which I guess was good timing in a way because people were you know in terms of access to services it was even less um, so yeah we have this online platform called Umi Health um, and it basically it, we're making it like the Netflix of pelvic health. So it's everything you'd ever want to know um, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy. Um, and actually, like myself, a personal trainer and a doctor set it up. So it's really kind of trustworthy information as well. So for maybe an expectant mother that might not be the fittest and they found out they're, they're going to be given birth in nine months, are there 
certain disciplines that they should engage in that are better than others, running, swimming, cycling, uh, you know, or is there a certain level? What, what would be your advice around somebody just trying to get into a better place before the birth? Yeah, so if you're kind of a complete beginner or you just want to start back into exercise, maybe you haven't been exercising for a while, um, well, like the World Health Organization recommends that when you're pregnant that you try to do about 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. So that would be, you know, like, a good half an hour five days a week so it's actually that might surprise people it kind of sounds like a lot Um, and it's nearly on a par with when you're not pregnant to be fair so I guess kind of like setting your expectations around how much you're allowed to do as well is really important and then if you're a complete beginner or kind of getting back after a break then I would definitely say start gradually and don't go straight into high impact things so maybe start more with like walking swimming cycling basically doing what you enjoy so you can go to the gym you can do things in terms of like weightlifting you can do cardiovascular machines you know whatever floats your boat really it's just about starting gradually and then kind of picking up from there um and i'd also say that you know if you are keen but you just don't know where to start then walking is just really good it's it's so underrated um but you know you can pick up your speed your the length of time you walk for so even just starting with walking is really valuable and has all the benefits exercise will give you louise would you have general advice for an expectant mother that might be in a recreational fitness space that they're trying to get into yeah similar to what helen is saying um Maybe even to get a training diary because you mightn't be aware of how little kind of you are doing or how much you are doing. Um, and some of the other things that have been proven to help people exercise is, you know, exercise with a friend, make a date to do it because you're more likely maybe to continue with it. Invest in good footwear because, um, again, hormonal changes in that during pregnancy, you might be more prone to injury. Um Good wet, good wet gear in this country like that if you want to build up your heart rate and um, get a little bit out of breath so it's moderate activity try and add in a few hills um, that sort of thing um, and then I, just to John to get in as well postpartum I think it's so important and to any um, uh, woman who's listening in here who's had a baby and wants to start exercising I'd really recommend going to pelvic health physio just like Helen I did that back in um, down in Clarny here in Kerry and for two sessions and that's really what got me started back in the road to playing football again um, because again they're they're the experts for the area of checking out for example your your scar even after having a c-section your uh, pelvic floor your abdominal strength and then your whole body because you have to remember you can focus in on your your core and your pelvic floor but you know there's achilles hamstrings all these things they're all affected by the fact that maybe you haven't ran in nine months and you're now trying to get back to playing a competitive potentially level of sport so a women's health physio is well worth the money that you spend on them um unfortunately a lot of the time it's it is privately that you need to access these people because um just our, our public health service are probably more dealing with the reactive side of maybe you know tears and that through labor um but it's well worth spending the money on a private public or women's health physio postnatally if you want to start back with exercise Olive, we saw Tatiana Maria like in Wimbledon reached the semi-finals she's had two children it can be done the general advice that you'd like to give like during and post not necessarily for elite athletes but also for um, you know recreational fitness um, and people get involved in that that just the recreational just like the general public I suppose to just put it into simple words and just to to build it up gradually um, and look to listen to your body um, and, and to be kind to yourself. You know, pregnancy is like, you know, you can be lucky and, and you can spring back really quickly, but pregnancy is physically difficult on, on your body. So it is about taking it step by step. And really what Louise has, has, I think she's covered it all there, but just these like little steps and setting yourself little goals. Um, the training diary is a great one. And I why I found that so helpful um, was that you could actually see the progress you're making because you're starting, you know, as, as an elite, I was starting at such a low level compared to what I would have been used to. So you could see your little bits of progress there. And and, and I found that very motivating. Um, and you don't have to be elite to, you know, to keep a diary of, of what you're doing. 
Um, so, yeah, and, and just enjoy it. Like, you know, um, I would say that my daughter was just used to being outside. You know, it was really good for her. She was around people um, to a huge extent um, and she just loved the fresh air and 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 being out and about. So I think and certainly I would have seen other athletes on, on training camps with, with their little, you know, babies as well. So. You know, it is about enjoying what you're doing and and thinking about, I mean, what you're teaching your child as well, like, you know, to be healthy, to be active um, and and the importance of that and to give them that love of of the the fresh air side. Um, So, yeah, it's 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 a win for everybody. Louise, what's the training plan then for you now of a regular week now, say next week, if you were, you know, what would you be doing each day? Um, well, I suppose I'm in the middle of club football championship at the moment, so we've a, a game a week. Um, so I'll do two strength gym sessions and two regular training sessions with the club, um, and that's probably enough. We so that's five sessions a week, including a match. You know, you wonder. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a that's a big commitment. When you see the the, the players going into the AFLW and getting paid, I suppose you can you can understand why they are. <laughs> Yeah, well, again, I suppose I love it. So to me, it's it's well, yeah. the gym sessions, the baby's at in the gym usually with me um, if he's not in bed. And then the, the training sessions, I'm obviously, you know, he's with dad or he's with my mom or my mother-in-law. And uh, I find it just gives you back a sense of maybe freedom and back, back a sense of my identity as being maybe an athlete as well. And then I, come bounce, I bounce out the door and I bounce back in because you're delighted to see him after a few hours again. So... It, it's a win-win. No, it's not difficult at all, John. Love it. No, fair play. No, that's that's definitely the right attitude. Um, Olive, what's your training regime now? I know you've retired, but what's the, the daily fitness regime for you now? Yeah, it's funny. When you're an athlete, you can't understand how people struggle to fit in <laughs> a bit of exercise. But I have to be really focused myself to fit it in. Um, so a lot of the things that Louise mentioned there, like setting a time that, that you exercise every day. So what I try to do is to is to kind of run for 30 to 40 minutes, five days a week. Um, and just to, to keep uh, moving away, do something with the kids. You know, um, after I had, after I retired, I had two more children. Um, so I have a seven-year-old and and a nearly nine-year-old. So it's it's to be active with them um, and to show them that anything is possible. We You know, we love to, to hike up a mountain or, you know, we go for a swim. Um, so I suppose exercise. I'm really exercising for pleasure, and and that's a really good place to be. And Helen, uh, obviously the best look of the birth. Thanks. Uh, be very very soon. Um, just uh, before we go, I suppose the joys of having a child for the first time, how it's changed your life for the better. Like we're talking about fitness here, and that's obviously very important. But aside from the sleepless nights, like it's it's a life changing experience. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So we wish you the best with it. And you. for you, Louise, like it is a life changing experience. Uh, it's not just all about the fitness. It's about um, the joy of motherhood, I suppose. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's, um, you know, I actually found probably pregnancy tougher because, as I say, you're not training, you're not playing, but you don't have a baby to mind yet. It's growing inside you, which is obviously important. But actually afterwards, you know, when you have them in your arms, it's it's incredible um, and I'm really enjoying the feeding journey as well. And then it's it's lovely to be able to get back to what I did beforehand, too. And just like Olive was saying, hopefully in years to come to that, you showed them that this is doable and, you know, trying to break down barriers so that more um, women can not just assume they need to maybe give up sport just because they, they have a baby and that the support structures that might be there around them, whether it be just the partner, the family members, the friends or the, the coaches, um, that they kind of maybe cut a little bit of slack around um, having the baby around a little bit and, and encourage people to get back. That's just seen as more normal. Yeah, absolutely. Louise Galvin, Olive Lachnan, thanks so much for joining us on the Saturday panel today. Thanks very much, Anne. Thank and, you. And Helen, best of luck and thank you for coming in. Thanks, John. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball.